Welcome to Breakthrough the Ordinary Podcast. Are you ready to commit to your future self? If you are, sibling duo Mark and Claudine Schramante will take you on a journey of self-discovery to unlock your highest potential. Through impactful conversations with thought leaders, coaches, healers, and entrepreneurs, we share practical strategies and tools to have the life you envision. New episodes drop every Monday. And we have the wonderful Jessica Alstrom with us. She is the creator of the Quantum Method International Academy of Accelerated Consciousness and Quantum Fitness. She uses her extrasensory abilities combined with quantum biology, early childhood development, epigenetics, and energy medicine to help her students all over the world utilize and access higher levels of consciousness, healing, and to learn the secret science of alchemy to transform their mediocre mediocre realities into extraordinary possibilities that is a lot of stuff going on there that is there is yeah happy to have you thanks for having me this is awesome yeah happy new year guys or at least happy new year yeah Yeah. yes Yes. absolutely yeah that's great i'm looking forward to diving a little deeper understanding some of those elements and Mm -hmm. how you have it um but you know our first question always since we are breakthrough the ordinary and that's what we're about people having their breakthroughs we always like to start the conversation off and and understanding what your thoughts are on what people get to break through so they can have the life like what are the things that they get to have their breakthrough and so they can have the life they they say they want I think the first thing that they have to break through, and, and really this is a usually a shock to them, is most people are not who they think they are. You know, it's like you, you really have to break the habit of being yourself to be yourself. So there's so much conditioning and there's so much little pockets of trauma and accidents and, you know, little failures and little, you know, unrequited loves and so many years and where you were placed in the sibling family and what religion you were and where did you go to school? And this creates your identity, right? And this identity creates your personality and your personality creates your personal reality. So by the time you come to me, you're living this reality like, I I am here and I want to be here. And I'm like, exactly, because the real you would be here, right? But this you that you had to become through, you know, the filter of society or, you know, family dynamic or just years of repetitive practice that literally every ounce of my work is literally about unlearning. It's about unpacking. It's about like unbecoming. So my entire work with quantum biology is getting everyone back to their factory settings. Because I believe that when we're in those baby spaces, like we knew who we were. We were confident, you know, we were, we were talkative, we were funny, we were charming, you know, we, we cried, we were allowed to have these emotions. And then it was like the life just kind of started beating us into this like puzzle piece that never really fit anywhere. And, you're, and we're like, I wanna be there. Because really, that's where your heart is, but your head had to like develop this other course of action to be accepted, you know, to be successful. And and really, at the end of the day, when they when they come to me, I'm like, we've got to like chip all this away. And then that is just alignment. And then, boom, it's like a quantum leap. Wow. Um, it, so I just thought of when you said breaking the habit of, of being yourself, it made me think of Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza, yeah. He's right, brilliant. right. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure we're going to dive into a little neuroscience yeah. here, right? Because we are oh, so absolutely. wired. Like you said, the conditioning, everything starts to create mm-hmm. that pattern. I'll just right. say, like the conditioning. And yep. and that's mm-hmm. that's not an easy place to go, but it, there's the possibilities, which I'm hearing you say. is like, oh, yeah, you could still make a different turn. You don't have to keep doing what you're used and to. You know what? I don't, I don't even think you really need to make a different turn because I think that that oh. bigger you is always going to kind of like, you know, when you're in a GPS and you go the wrong way, and it's like rerouting. There's always going to be a rerouting phase for you. It's never like you've made the wrong choice. It's always like you're exactly where you need to be right now to basically just redirect your choice where, you know, like who you choose to be, because it's not going back and going this way. It's just like, I'm here. So how can I get here from here? So we always want to be in that present moment of going, like reconciling our moment instead of like, you know, all this regression processing and, and not to say that it's not brilliant and I haven't done a thousand hours of it, but I truly believe that we are in a very fast paced evolutionary process right now and we can biohack time. Time is on our side right now. So before, you know, we would have to like really dig down deep. But because of the way the energy is moving these days and how the planet's waking up, we, we can 
buy into that kind of hundred monkey effect where, you know, it's just like somebody knows something and then it's like goes into the field of consciousness. So just like our kids, I've got four of them. My oldest is 26. My youngest is nine. They know more than I do about consciousness just because it's in the field when they were born into it. So every generation is asking and developing. And so this, this byproduct of just actually catching a wave and then writing it into alignment is kind of like a detour. So it doesn't matter really where you are. It's perfect for where you're going. All right. So, wow. Yeah, Very I interesting way you're bringing the biohacking. Bring, of time. The biohacking <laughs> you talk about quantum alchemy. Like how, so how do you do that? So maybe I, I should ask, how, what are the tools or how do you biohack and quantum alchemist into this new reality or this wave that we're going to ride. Well, let's look at, let's look at like, for me, like what I teach my students alchemy means, because I think that might help. You know, there's obviously many, many meanings, you know, turn, you know, lead into gold, right. And turn pain into power. But my definition is alchemy is all of me. So I'm not abandoning any of my dark side, my bad side, my broken side. I'm like, if I want to go fast, I need to have every ounce of me. Because the sweet spot of a biohacking frequency is acceptance. So when we're talking about going fast, right, we want to think about what we're constantly trying to avoid and what we're trying to, like, fix. Like, well, I'm broken and I need to heal and I need to do this and I need to do that. And that slows time down. But see, time was created for us in this time and space here to practice, prepare, and play for that which we decide we are. It was never about waiting, and that's where quantum fitness came in, right? We give up the weight, literally, metaphorically. And this idea of biohacking every aspect of your life, we biohack time, we biohack money, we biohack relationships, and we biohack our personal relationship. So we work in these like four elements of consciousness to basically say, well, instead of taking score, like I'm not where I want to be, just like any good chef would do, we take stock. What do we have? What do we got to work with? <laughs> right? Like what are the what is the wisdom that has come out of my broken pieces? Like what has that strength and courage come from my failure? We're gonna use every ounce of our potential. So I kind of look at it like an athletic coach at times too, where I'm going to take someone and yes, they have potentials, things that are naturally good at, that are great intuition, but I'm interested in the limits. Now I'm interested in those dark corners because I believe that we are yin and yang, right? Feminine, and masculine, and 50% of your intuition is actually in your dark side. So what I do is I parlay that, that limited part of you, the part you're kind of covering up, embarrassed by, all of that stuff. And we bring that forward and we develop it. So we bring out the potential in the dark, in the limits. And we say, you know, if this was loved, this part of you was loved, do you see how good it would be at that? Right. And, and it's just like, for me growing up as an abused child, like my, my extrasensory abilities came online very quickly because of my trauma. You see, it's like every negative is a shortcut. And if we're really thinking about alchemy, all of me, then I'm going to be working in my limits and my potentials. And I've got to find the potential in the limit. And then that way, I'm not half. I'm not, you know, I don't have a void inside of me that's searching for love or answers. It's like, I just got to find a part of me that already knows. And that is the version that we can connect with that higher power and then direct connect, like having your own Wi-Fi. Wow. That's a very different concept than you hear a lot of. It's, uh, well, it's a lot to take in. Can, can we, <laughs> you mind if I ask you, like, if we Please. can apply this? So I, I, if I could bring up the concept of shame. All right, so my first introduction to it really was through probably John Bradshaw, and, and I, 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 I certainly appreciate what Brene Brown has brought it and, and some other of our thought yes. leaders. So we think of shame to me, I think it's a place of, it is the it, it's it, we hold it in our dark side. Exactly what you're saying is because it's it's the part of us that needs love, but instead we've covered it over as my a brokenness or however right. you want to call it. So if I heard you correctly, it would be how do I love that part? Even though I I I have shame around it, if I loved it, could we transform it into one of my superpowers? I'm just going to say that as a superpower. Yeah, that you're one hundred percent right. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, first we have to, so again, we, we don't want to go in and transcend immediately. We have to actually go in and, and, and kind of do some acceptance work around it. So what we do is we unpack the shame. So we look at like, okay, and, and shame has a personality. This is one thing that we're, we are going to learn here is like that each of these lower frequencies, shame, humiliation, right? Like fear, they all have personalities, which means they like to act out in certain behaviors. And when my study of shame I found is that you'll do simultaneously both personality uh, behavioral aspects. You'll, you'll shame others and you'll over nurture so you're over nurturing someone to kind of like make up for that shameful feeling in your heart. And then you'll find yourself like that darker part of you, like wanting to shame someone else because I feel shame. It's like the bully effect, right? And so what I've seen is like these mothers who just give and give and give and give, yet they're like, shaming someone over here. This like doesn't even match their personality. I'm like, because what I've noticed is anything below boredom has split personality of victim and perpetrator. So I'll be like, okay, what, where's your shame being a victim, like over nurturing your kids, over giving over here, rescuing everyone. And where is your shame perpetrating? Cause like, we're going to find it. It's probably your spouse or, you know, your kid that triggers you, right. Or someone at work, because it's like, oh, I don't mean it. But it's almost like shame has to be expressed through a positive and a negative spectrum. So first we find that element and we go, okay, well, this is where you're acting shame in your, you know, your kind of victim space. This is your perpetrator. Let's bring them into the middle, right? Let's get these two to meet. And then we work a little bit with that kind of inner like balance effect. And then we say, then we play games because now we got to bring forth the inner child that says, I don't want to be shamed. Like to me, shame means I have done wrong, right? Humiliation is something about me is wrong. So when I have done something wrong for whatever reason, the inner child doesn't feel deserving, doesn't feel worthy. So it's acting out in victim perpetrator. And that's why they're here instead of over here where they want to be. So we got to say, okay, let's play the game of duality. We play lots of games. Everyone thinks it's like hardcore science. We're literally playing games all day. So we say, okay, we've, we've kind of unpacked the victim perpetrator. We can see it. We can accept it. It makes sense. We're just trying to get our power back here. So what can we do with that energy, right? Now we're going to play the duality game. Well, what's the opposite of shame? Well, it's also, I am proud, right? I, it's dignified. It's, it's like, it's like, think about it. When you feel shame, it's like, so we do this and I have my, I have my students dive into Latin definitions, biblical definitions, because what happens is when you really start unpacking these, these first terms like shame, and then you have to go find the opposite. And what you're seeing is, is that you're, you're literally playing out these characters that have nothing to do with you. And so we can say, well, for me, like shame is like the opposite is like, I'm proud of myself. I'm proud that I tried. I'm proud that I'm sitting here unpacking this right now. I'm proud that, you know, I have been able to help so many people. And so then what we do is we reinstall in a neutral point, right? We have to find neutrality in order to reinstall because neutrality is your factory setting, right? No judgment. It just is. So once we get back to the factory setting, then we say, okay, we're going to now from morning until night, we're going to practice being proud. And it takes time, right? And you, and every time you, you know that habit would come up where you want to rescue someone or shame someone, I'm going to practice being proud of me. I'm going to be practice proud of you, even if it's hard to find. And then eventually what happens is the inner child starts feeling proud of itself. And I've seen when I've done hypnosis and we, we ask the word worthy, the, the inner child doesn't know what that is. So we've replaced the word worthy with I am allowed. And I'm allowed means I'm deserving and worthy. Think about it, right? So I was the middle child and I was never allowed. So of course I wasn't worthy, right? So now I'm allowed to be proud of myself. I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to say no to you. I'm allowed, right? And so now we're like changing the context of that character, but we can only do it in a neutral place. We can't do it when the, in the energy is still victim and perpetrating over there. Like we actually have to bring forth it and unpack it so they can see how their behavior is. Like, well, I didn't even know I was doing that to my spouse. I'm totally bullying him, 
right? Because he loves me so much. He's being a victim, so he's easy to bully. And these ones over here are victims, and so I'm overgiving. You see, so it's like they can see their behavior first. Because again, you know, without witness, the observation, we cannot illuminate anything. But I could say, you know, I have had so much practice with shame. How could that become my superpower, even though now I'm practicing being proud? Well, I know what other people feel like when they're in shame. Like that becomes one of my compassionate powers because I can feel that when they're doing that, when there's someone's bullying me now, I can actually see where it's coming from, right? When someone's trying to overgive to me, I can see where that's coming from. So now what used to be like two arms tied behind my back called shame, trying to get to the finish line is now acceleration, if that makes sense. No, oh, that, that does. I mean, right. it's a very different come from distinction that you have it because I, you, you're just presence to me to right when someone is in their shame, what does that look like when I'm in relation to them? And I had never thought about it from their own space of lack of, I'll say acceptance, allowance, as you use that word, um, and that I love that line. It's through observation you can you know, illuminate. It's, right. You know, you got right. Well, you can't see. You, you can't. You can't heal it because it's, you're unaware of it. Right. Thank you. And the idea. I mean, I know I've heard it, but the clarity of that there's both sides operating because I'm looking at myself aware. Yeah, that that shame or that judgment or whatever is coming out somewhere, even if I don't do it outwardly i do it from my inside it's still there playing the both sides oh it's still there on some level yeah i mean there's it's like at neutral. least at least two of you in there if not more <laughs> right and and here's how i like ask ask my clients or and my students to to find those more kind of predominant selves is like who are you with your spouse can, can you know versus your best friend who are you at work versus who are you with money you know, who are you with, you know, your family at Thanksgiving versus when, you know, you're out on the field playing. And it's interesting to see that the, how we kind of shape shift into these different spaces where where over here I feel so free because no one knows about my guilt and shame. But if I go home for Thanksgiving, it's all the old stories. Everybody's pulling out the scrapbooks. And now I'm that eight year old in shame and I'm trying to be spiritually like enlightened yet. I'm shoving my food, you know, my face with sugar because it's my only dopamine way to like cope with family gatherings. So again, it's like we, when we work with someone, we unpack all of them <laughs> because we're like, we're going to need every one of you if we're going to get over here and we don't want to leave anyone out. Like for, for my work is this, there has to be zero judgment. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've come from. You know, I, it doesn't matter because every ounce of you is, is about creating that full spectrum, like dark and light like heads and, and he heads and tails of a coin. That's what I said. I said, if you didn't have the heads or the tail side, you wouldn't be worth anything, right? So you actually need both sides. And there's so much genius that's happened in the dark that we don't give ourselves credit for. You know, like for me as a kid growing up in a house that was never safe, no privacy, there was a lot of abuse. I learned to manipulate energy. I learned to read body language. I learned to anticipate people's next thoughts right and that and you know people are like oh that's so sad i'm like it's kind of a gift right i mean i, I wouldn't say that looking back i don't want to wouldn't want to go through that again maybe or maybe i would but now it's kind of like wow like i got so much out of that so much wisdom came from that heightened state of my nervous system being in fight or flight my entire childhood right? It, it destroyed my physical body by the time I went into my healing journey. But honestly, the byproduct of what I have to work with from that is priceless. I, I agree. Because I remember the first time I heard, you know, your traumas, which gave you extrasensory perception, your vigilance because of that unsafety gave you insight into people and stuff. And I was like, I, I remember it was like an awakening going, oh my God. So all that's, that's why I got this depth that I can see into people or I can read somebody walking in the room from that. And it doesn't have to be a negative. No, no, no. And I don't think it's always necessarily from severe trauma because I, I believe that for a child that their reality, because they're playing that, that both 
that yin and yang spectrum that every child, regardless of how feathered their nest was, had experience is where they did not feel allowed, they did not feel safe, they did not feel heard. I mean, I just took my students through a huge, like, um, study of narcissistic mothers and sons just a couple months ago. And that's all about over nurturing and like over developing. And so you can see that there is no like, there's no um, wrong or, you know, there's no like definition of trauma. You know, it's like, you know, I, I say you, your brother got the blue cup and you wanted the blue cup and now mom loves him more than you. Right. Because you're this, you know, you're a little tiny person and your perception of reality is that, that these people are the universe and they're not choosing you, right? So now you're 30 and the guy you love is not choosing you if you haven't fixed it, right? So it's like these very subtle things, we got to understand that anything that drops below like lower conscious awareness, which is something that's like in your blind spot, it vibrates like that, that like music that's on in the background, like you can't really hear it, but the universe can, and it includes it in law of attraction. So all of those little songs that are still playing, it's not fair, I'm not good enough, right? I'm better than that person. You notice how that, like that's the perfect way to see your yin and yang in action is like insecurity and then also like arrogance. Like in the same, like I'm better than that person, but I'm insecure over here. You see like it's like this dual universe. So I'm like, we need to face each other because look at that word dual, right? It's like a challenge. Like it's, it's, it's like a face off. And I think that right now what we're all doing is we're being asked to kind of look in the mirror, right? And if you cannot find it in the direct mirror, then look in the mirror of your people, places, and things, because that's also a reflection of you. Wow. And you, you've used the word frequency a few times and I had, uh, you know, even the energy, the lower energies of like shame yes. and, 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 uh, fear. Is that what you mean? Like, uh, you know, about, um, frequency formulas, understanding what everybody's alchemy is like, oh, your, your frequency, cause you're nurturing so much of this frequency. How do you work with that with the person? Yeah, it's, you- it's just a term. I mean, but basically what it, it's kind of a signature. So to me, vibration is like, um, it's like a wave, right? And then like frequency would be like the set of waves. It would be kind of like that chronic consistent, you know, there's some people that are just very negative. That would be their, that would be their frequency, right? But they can vibe sometimes good. And so we're looking for kind of like rooted chronic frequencies. Like, so for me, there's basically five. There's, you know, there's shame, there's guilt, there's humiliation, right? There's fear, there's resentment. And then the number one, the one that is hidden from most of us is grief. And so that's what I have. I mean, I would tell you that the bulk of what we're doing in quantum fitness, as we've really been unpacking this bag, is is grief. We're all hiding it because we've been told from a very young age, don't feel it. You know, it's like, think about it. When some when something bad happens, even as a mother, I remember doing this. As soon as something bad happened, I would try to stop my kids from experiencing it. Like, whatever I needed to do, stop crying, fix it. You know, it's like interrupt all of a sudden. Now think about when someone passes. What are we usually doing? We're in fight or flight. Go, 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 go. Take care of everything. Get everything done. Make everyone else feel better. Do we ever really sit and grieve? right? And I think that people, humans grieve people, but do you grieve the time you've lost in that relationship? Do you ever grieve the money you lost in that last investment deal? Because see, this is a relationship universe and I'm having a relationship with money. I'm having a relationship with time. And when we lose these things, we don't really like even spend time going, let me see how I actually feel about this. We're just on to the next. It's the anticipation of the future being better. That's why being in the present moment is so scary because the past just starts smacking you, right? It's just like, if you stay still long enough, your past is going to hit you. That's why everyone you see is constantly chasing the future because what they're really afraid of is literally having everything that's unfinished, that's, that doesn't have closure, that hasn't been reconciled or transcended or integrated, it's going to smack into us. And I think that what we're seeing this year is that it's happening regardless. That's why I said you're always in the perfect moment because it's going to, it's going to be there when you need it. 
thank you for even saying that grief is one of the, the places because I, I had the opportunity to read the book. I think it's called The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And, you know, it, yes, there's the grief and the loss of a person in, 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 in a breakup. And there's the micro grief, the grief of expectations, the grief of dreams, the grief, right? Like that we don't stop and be like, because we hoped it would be something. And so uh, we're grieving the end of the relationship, but we're also grieving this dream we created that this could be it. Um, and you're right this year, you know, I've done more grief counseling. I've been a therapist for 27 years. I have never been, grief is not my specialty. Um, though it was always a part of it. I'm an adoption expert and a trauma oh, expert. Wow. So there's grief all the time. Oh, I mean, constant. It's it, it, always. That's so why I said I've worked with families. Like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm always in the grief cycle somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Uh, somewhere. And I think we have this on, on a global scale because, right, the vax created this, like this hope or, right, that this year was going to be the better year than 2020. And here we are. And I think that's where we got this word languish has come back into our distinction. But, but you're right. I think it's an uncomfortability because we can't do it. We can't, we can't do something through grief, right? It's like, uh, right, when someone dies, you're right. We're like, I'll take care of the flowers and I'll take care of the aftermath and I'll take – we can't do that right now in 2021. It's like, I, I, I don't know what I can do. And we're maybe go back to work. Maybe we're not going back to work. Right? Uh, it's two days a week, no, no. Uh, it's such an interesting place um, yes. energetically and, and psychologically, I think, and in I the don't think, of the world. I don't, I don't actually think there's any other frequencies in the universe besides grief and love. I think everything is a pseudo experience of it. And I think that we we use the other you know emotions as a way to kind of block the fall of grief, okay? Because if we were all the way into it, think about it. If you were truly humiliated by someone, and you just went all the way into loss of your own like knowing of your identity, that and just went all the way into the suffering of what that feels like, instead of er, let me go be something else, let me go build a mask here. I'm going to run away. Let me project. Like, what if we just fell all the way into it? And and so when my clients come to me, it's like we, we've got this all these little, like, compartmentalized relationships, but it's all grief. You know, humiliation is grief. I'm sorry. Shame is grief, but it's action grief. It's like trying to stop the grief from happening. And so what I teach my students is grief is homeless love. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. And anger is grief's bodyguard. And everything else is grief's bodyguard. Fear is anticipation of loss, right? I'm trying to break my fall. And notice how when we get older, we're always trying to break our fall. Kids, they're just like bouncing around. And so I, I had the opportunity to study my, um, I had what was like a kundalini awakening when I was seven months pregnant with my son. I got stung by um, a hive of bees when I was seven months pregnant and literally like went into a trance for hours and saw all kinds of stuff. So it wasn't like I wasn't crazy enough before that. And, uh, you know, just by the time he was born, I had opened a wellness center called Transcendence. And it was just like, I was on this mission. But what was happening to me at that time was my filters were being blown out, right? Like I was having all these, if you've ever been pregnant, it's like superhuman hormones in your body, creating a child, be, you know, now I've got bee like venom in my body and my immunity went, right? And I, I was seeing different stuff. But the interesting thing was I just saw grief and I saw love. That was it. There was nothing else. And there was just this manifestation of either absence of love or complete love. And it made total sense. Everything else is just a manifestation of the ghost of which one, right? And so it's, it's just been in this amazing journey. I mean, he's nine now. So it's a, a whole nine-year cycle that um, we've been in together. And I've been able to study his, his uh, childhood experience. So I work in the seven-year cycles. And I got to see from the time he was born when his ego imprint started to come in and like when he started to, to, to look and notice what time was. And it was interesting because in the fifth year cycle is when we're supposed to really fully integrate into self-love. And the fifth year is also the year that they realize what time is and they think they're running out of it. 
They don't have enough of it. That was like the, the toughest year with my son was when he started to like time. Like I'm having such a good time. I don't want to stop, you know? And, and it was hard because we're, we're divorced at that point. Cause I think my ex thought I was a loony bin because this was all happening like during our marriage. And I couldn't have, I didn't have a way to explain what was happening to me at the time. And, and so I've gotten to study him instead of like reading the textbooks of childhood development. I had literally studied every aspect of my son and he's nine now. So I've been like every, and I just seeing him go full into grief when he was a baby. Right. Can you imagine doing that now? Like how inappropriate. Right. And it's just like, they're, and guess what? If they're fully allowed to go in grief, right. No one's trying to stop it. It's a cycle. It's a season. It's like done. It comes in and it goes out. But what we do is we push it in, right? We hold on to it. You know, it's just like I, I give my students this experiment. I say, you know, if you hold this cup of water out here like this, right? You're, it's going to be heavy in like two, three minutes. Your, your arm's going to shake and it doesn't weigh that much, right? Because we're here with gravity. So what do we do with this water when we're walking around? I can't feel it now. This is what we do with our grief. Like if it's out here, I want to look at it. It's here. And now I don't even know. I don't even know it's here, but now it's part of my personality. See here, it's not part of my personality, but here it's part of my personality. And so that's what we're doing is we're unpacking what you thought was you. You're like, well, I know I just really like helping people that are struggling. Do you? Or do you really want to educate people? Because it's coming from a wounded place. Right. So that was that was like my expression of letting my son just be mad, be be in grief and be all of these things and watch how fast it went right through. And then I'm like, I'm 40 and I still got stuff in there, you know, 46 now. So. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, right. I always believe that it's the resistance to what we need to feel that that really gives us all that clogging and yeah. right and it becomes numb because we have to keep going and we have to survive and you know my grief isn't important if my kid is grieving my grief isn't important if i have to pay my gas bill right yeah. so it's like level of importance until you know you your check engine light turns into engine failure and you end up in my office or your <laughs> office right <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the the time hack or the, the even the idea of it, right? I, I never thought about it that way. When kids do understand, right? And we usually as parents will go, well, you know, you have until the end of, I don't know, square, but Bob's square pants or something like, right? Like right. that's how they can tell time. Like, oh, this, not so much. A, oh, that's a 30 minute episode, mom. It's just like, oh, at the end of that, right? Like by the time your, you know, your father gets home, you have to do that. Like, so they, they could stay, they gauge really to other right. external events. Right. Outside. And everything is based in their play and their joy and what they have to do. Cause at that time we were, we were divorced. And so he was like having this joyful moment and he'd be like, oh, what time do I have to go to my dad's house? And it was like, I could see that his present moment was being stolen. And I said, well, buddy, not till tomorrow, but he couldn't get his mojo back because all of a sudden he was having so much fun, right? That then he realized this is going to come to an end when I have to leave. And I was, it's like heartbreaking to watch because it's like, then they start to realize that they don't get freedom. And that's what is linked with time. So whenever we find a hack inside of time, we also find a freedom wound, right? I'm not free to do what I want. And think about that. That's your creativity. That's your expression, Right. And so then when you don't have freedom, what do you do? You piss freedom away and you get codependent with your freedom. So it's like victim perpetrator. So, again, it's like we're unpacking all of this stuff, you know, in the beginning of our, our relationship together with our students. And then we're like, OK, this is every piece. You know, it's like when you get back from a trip, there's dirty underwear. But then there's like a really cool necklace that you bought at the beach. And it's like you you get really you know, like, what do you want to do with all of this? Right. And it, we have to use all of it because, I mean, you're going to need to wash this underwear and use them again. So but we're going to purify those darker points of ourselves and we're going to turn them into some sort of superpower that you've been judging yourself for a really long time about. Mm -hmm. And that's to me, the ultimate biohack is not having to heal. You know, I think like I'm on a spiritual journey. I'm on a healing journey. Well, guess what? Law of attraction says, then you'll always be on that journey unless you can just say, okay, I'm broken. 
right? Um, I can't use my legs. Great. And it's interesting because when you fully accept it and go, well, what else can I do? Let me play the duality game here. Let me look at this. Let me unpack that. You totally accept you don't have the legs and then the legs are there because that's how the universe works is when you no longer need and you become the isness of your desire then you manifest it anyways. Right. So we do a lot of biohacking with money because that seems to be people's like measure of like their own worth, especially in our society. And, uh, and and like they'll punish themselves with money because they're running that shame program, you know, and or they're humiliated. So they're spending too much money to like keep that mask going. So we really have to look at everything very scientific and every very analytical with absolutely no judgment because why people behave the way they are is they're doing the best they can. I mean, they really are. They're self-preservation. They're just, you know, they're, I feel like we're all little kids in grown-up bodies trying to take care of other people, pretending to be grown-ups. It's hard. <laughs> that is absolutely. So could you give our audience and listeners just a few maybe hacks that they can start at least to start yeah. looking at, you know, they're not working with you. They should or, you know, whatever. But to start looking at. Ways. Well, I would say that the first thing is, is like, look at it just kind of in order to find a hack to use is first find something that you're really, really wanting to create in your life or something that you want that you do not have. Okay. And now I want you to think about something that you have that you don't want. Right. Because again, it's just like, there's this stuff you have that you don't want. And then there's the stuff you don't have that you want. Right. And we've got to see both reflections in order to see where we can kind of hack this. And, and the object of this game, because we're working with inner children here, is that we're replacing it. Right. I don't want this and I have it. Okay. And I do want that and I don't have it. What we usually do is go to comparison, spend hours on social media looking at other people have what we don't have. And we say, okay, well, if I created the problem, then I also created the solution because I am creator. So my only job here is to flip this, right? So what behavior could I create every day that would shift the energy of resistance over here, right? And shift the energy of lack over here because that I'm lacking that which makes the universe keep keep me in a lack program. I'm in resistance of what I have over here that I don't want. And lava set, what you persist, you get. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the opposite game with resistance. I'm going to fully accept everything in my life right now that I don't want. And I am going to let go of the need of having that, but I'm going to embody it. I'm not going to let go of my dream. I'm going to say, okay, but... Say that like trip over there. I really want it. I can't afford it right now, right? Because I got this over here, you know, mother-in-law I'm taking care of, right? And so it's like, I want to go on this trip, but she's costing me the money. You see how it's like this problem. Go down to this is a solution, right? So all you're going to do is we call it the three Ps because we don't wait. The universe does not wait. That's BS, by the way, when your patience is a virtue. No, there is no time and space. So we say, okay, if you're waiting, you're, 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 you're running a trauma, right? So what we do instead of waiting, right? We like, we unpack these two scenarios here. We see it, we accept both of the situations and we say, okay, now we're going to practice, prepare, play. So the three P's is what you use instead of waiting. Practice the alignment of being that energy. So what would I feel like if I already went on this trip Right. I start embodying it. I start dressing it. I start speaking it. I start working with it. Maybe I have to do a little like shame processing in the, in the meantime of deserving it. Right. I have to find my reflection of this mother-in-law in this resistance. Right. Maybe this is a way where you find her shame acting out. So now you're working in compassion instead of judgment and resistance over here. And while you're working in what you do have and becoming what you want, time disappears and you're like, oh, it's right here. Someone's like, hey, you want this free trip? You're like, yes. And I'm friends with my mother-in-law now because I understand she was just a reflection of my own chain. You see, so it's like, we don't like push anything away. We like work with both sides because the beauty of you is you are left and right hemisphere of masculine and feminine, which means you are equal parts etherical magic, inspiration, desire, intuition, and you are equal parts doing. 
And it has to be equal parts, which you're feeling and you're doing, you're feeling and you're doing. But if you're not accepting, like if I'm, I'm in resistance, like I got to get away from the mother-in-law to get on this trip so I can feel free, it will never happen. You've got to feel free with your mother-in-law and then the trip manifests organically with no action. You know what I mean? Taken from, from you anyways, except for what you're working on here. The universe will figure out a way to put it right in your lap. Practice, prepare, play. Practice, prepare, play. Right. And you're practicing for the vibration and the, the trip itself, maybe, or, you know, whatever it is you're wanting to manifest. You're preparing. So when you're preparing, your biochemistry is like, oh, where are we going? Like a kid. Right. Where are we going? We're doing something. OK. Ooh, OK. And then we play like I've practiced. I prepared. Now I get to play. It's recess. Right. Now I just get to go play and I get to not think. So another word for play is surrender. Right. Because when we play, everything's taken care of. So our entire day is practice, preparing and playing for our own unique higher self. So what it is, is my higher self is the best best part of me, but it's also the most wise part of me, which means that the dark part of me is healing, but it's doing it in this practice, prepare, play, practice, prepare, play. It's kind of like, I realized, I realized this, the, how to heal the dark part of ourselves without healing it. Thousands of hours of cutting cords and regression was to give it a different job, right? Darkness is running. Uh, I don't have what I want. No one loves me, right? But what if we promoted that darkness because of its wisdom and hours in, in, the, in the dark? Like School of Hard Knocks, that's your university. And so I found this when I was teaching first grade. I worked at a, a private school for a while, and I, I taught private school. And this little boy, he was literally my nemesis. He was six years old. His name was Vincent, and he was so disruptive. And he was constantly getting the class routed up and he was constantly heckling me. And he was very intelligent. I was like very triggered, you know, I'm like he's smarter than me at this, you know, like he just knew how to distract everybody. And I started watching his behavior, I almost quit because it was like, I couldn't do my job. And then I watched how nothing was happening in a good way because he, he, we would literally start something and he'd be like, and we'd all go where he was going, right? We all found our way in his orbit. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to study his behavior a little bit. I started watching him with his dad and I could see that that bullying energy was coming from dad's not seeing me and hearing me. So then I'm not going to let this class hear and see her, right? So it was a shame. It was a guilt and shame thing. It's humiliation. So I thought, well, what does this kid really need? I go, he's so smart. Like, I mean, he, his level of intelligence to like pull this whole thing together that he does every day is like blowing my mind. I said, what if I give him a new job? What if I promote him? So one day, this was like my last effort. I called him up. I said, can I just tell you like every day you distract my class. And I said, you're really good at this. You're better at this than I am. I said, would you for a whole week be my teacher's assistant? Because I need help. And he was like, what? I go, like, literally, you're really good at leadership. <laughs> Could you please help me? Would you help me be a teacher's assistant? And, of course, he, like, like kind of resisted it for a minute. And he's like, well, I guess if I had time. Well, let me just put it this way. He became, like, the best student in my class. And he became the one who was, like, he had a purpose. So what if our darkness had a purpose, but it was coming from love? Because, yep. I mean, think about it. Your darkest points are your most intelligent points. Light is just illumination. Dark, that's wisdom. There's magic in there. And all we have to do is give that dark a new job, promote it. We're not demoting. You're not in trouble. Like, okay, well, you're doing all this from a place of not love. But what if you were doing it for love, right? And you were rewarded and you were loved and appreciated. And so anyways, I mean, I think that was what, 22 years ago. And we're still friends on Facebook, Vincent and I, you know, I mean, he's <laughs> grown up, he's become a Senator, right? I mean, like, I mean, this kid went from like, we were worried, you know, cutting himself to leading my entire class, catching grammar errors for me. Like this kid, because again, it's that intuition that sparked from, you know, not being seen and heard. So you have to be the one who sees and hears. And if it's coming from a sad place, it's not going to look pretty. But what if it was coming from a loving place? 
Uh, that's a great example. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we all have yeah. Vincent inside of us, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, That's yes, sabotaging and getting everybody riled up and like not getting focused and not in your daily routine, right? So I kind of look at it like we have to find that little guy inside of us, that little girl inside of us, and we got to work with them so much more than we're working with the higher, higher self doesn't need leadership, Right. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's beckoning us. So we've got to work with those limited parts of us that don't want to be happy because they don't believe in it. Right. Oh, thank you. Wow. I, you know, I, I appreciate everything that we've been talking about. I don't know if there's any words of wisdom that you would like to share with our, our listeners about this, you know, their own reprogramming or anything that you feel like, you know, here's the last gift I want you to sit with today as you listen to yeah. this podcast. Right. Well, I think it's perfect timing because here we are going into 2022. And I said, this is going to be the year of the catch 22. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So, <laughs> right, you might as well, right, just really instead of res going in and having a resolution, how about just like reflecting and, and being like, I've never been broken and I'm going to move forth in 2022, but I'm going to make it my personal mission to use all of me. Right. And I'm going to get to know these parts of myself that I'm, I'm afraid of or these parts of myself that are disgusting. And I'm going to really like sit with them and I'm going to like understand them and I'm going to learn from them. And because, again, then you get to cross through this threshold of this new year, not like, oh, I got to go lose weight or I got to go do this or I got to go get this. It's like focus on you. That word, you, universe, you in verse. It's your story. No one's coming to save you because you've got parts of yourself that will sabotage someone saving you. And that's the very part of you that needs saving. So focus on you, right? You'll be challenged big time all the way to March with codependency, boundaries, right? And your consistency and loyalty to your own word. So might as well practice now. <laughs> Great Whoa. wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, I feel like this whole place, this whole conversation today really has been an embracing the shadow side in with love. Because yeah. yeah. I, I know I work with some clients who are just like, ah, eh. Mm, like it's like this place they reject and put push yeah, away. That's a versus... love and light community, right? Yeah, and you're like, right? yeah, it's like everything is love and light except you and except that. And you're like, wait, what? Right, <laughs> no, right. right. Everything's love in disguise. Everything is love in disguise. Everything. Yeah. That's what attracted me to you. I'm follow, you know, from Facebook is like you're just bold and out there, and you're breaking the rules and putting sexy <laughs> out. Put like you're just, and it's like damn, she's just, you're breaking some of the um, new age yeah, rules or ways right. of being. And I looked at it and I'm like, man, she's just, like, there's no excuse. There's no pretend. There's no, like, worried about what you think. Like, you're just doing it. I'm just right. putting it I mean, out. You, you know, don't like you it? Yeah. You get to be a scientist. I get to, you know, get free fashion. You know, it's like when you become an influencer, like I get to work in like the hardcore science of our neurology of our future. Yet I get to wear cool clothes. I get to be a mom. I get to be a woman. You know, like I look at it, all of these parts of me, if you follow me on social media, you're like, wait, what? There's so many things happening. But it's like, oh, that's that part of her. And that's that part of her. But see, I'm embracing all of it. Because our sexuality is our sacral energy, and that's our creativity, and it's not about sex. It's about expressing that fullness of who you are from a loving, healed place. And yeah, we got to push the envelope, because at this point, we don't want to fall into the stigma or the boxes of what a healer looks like or what a teacher looks like. Right. We want to go. I'm judging you from your cover here, but I'm interested because I love that. Please judge me. Right. And because what it's going to do is it's going to take you inside of you. And then we can have a fun conversation because at the end of the day, like I'm a child that is fully like in an adult body, but I have learned how to be childlike and still pay my bills and my taxes and have relationships. But when you realize that the inner child is the hybrid of the dark and light part of you and it loves both of you. Right. Think about your kids. They don't care what dad did. They don't care what mom did. They just want to love you. And that, that hybrid is your inner child. And I have four kids. 
right? And so I see they are the best and worst of me and they are the best and worst of their dad. And my job is to love all of it. And that's why they're here as my teachers. And so my inner child is the one that knows how to love my darkness, right? Because it's half of the, like, that's my dad. Like, that's my mom, right? That's, that was me when I was unconscious. That was me when I was afraid. That was me when I was hurt, right? Hurt people hurt people. I love you anyways. So it's really going to be, that's why we, everything we do is a game. Because the inner child's like, I like games. And then he goes like, oh, right? I don't like games. So we bring the inner child and it becomes the mediator. It becomes the malleability of being able to change this hardware. And then we can put in new software through behavior. Wow. Thank you so much for very different thank you guys approach. for having me. This is awesome. It, it I love was. this platform. Uh, yes, yes. I, I agree with you. Thank you. And I'm going to invite our listeners to really be in a space of what can they fully love about themselves mm. and accept about themselves. And if you're you know, courageous enough to share that with us on social media, tag the BTO podcast on you know, any social media platform, because I think that's the challenge here. And it, I, I, don't not, I don't mean challenge from a resistance, but that's just like the invitation, the duel, yeah. right, is how to love all of yourself. And so what is a place that is in you that really gets to have that light and that energy, that frequency? Yeah, and what part of you needs more love this time of year? You know, this is not the happiest time of year energetically, you know, and, and this is an opportunity for us to, to really work with our limits, spend more time with those limiting spaces with you than the, that stuff that the highlight reel, right? <laughs> Developing developing those limits because now how much faster are you going to go right yeah thank you so uh, much you, for all your Jessica. wisdom what a yeah. beautiful gift to uh, end this year on so <laughs> I thank so you fun. for your time. Yeah, thank and I look you. forward to connecting and following you and learning more. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we anyone can you know follow Jessica. We'll have everything in the show notes. But for today, we want to thank you for listening to the Breakthrough the Ordinary podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and our deep dive into the alchemy of self and the wisdom so you can live your extraordinary life. If you'd like to support the podcast, please leave us a rating and share uh, with others. You can follow us um, our latest episodes on the BTO Podcast, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.